Somebody shout, we will. We will. Get the last laugh. Get the last laugh. Preach, bro. Get the last laugh. We see it in his presence. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you and we magnify your name. We thank you for the purity of your spirit. As we enter and transition into the preached word, God, do not depart from us. Your presence has been with us in song. Your presence has been with us in praise and in worship. And we ask now for the focus and the concentration to still be on you. That you may be glorified, but that your people will be edified to do your work, to do your service. To fulfill the work and the commission of your kingdom, God. The only way for your kingdom to come is for us to do what you have commissioned us to do. And we pray that through the preachment of this word, God, that you will oil us up. Mm. That your anointing fall and break loose in this place. Forever will you be magnified and glorified for the destruction of every yoke of the enemy. Mm. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Let the church say amen. 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 We will get the last laugh. As the old saying goes, he who laughs last, laughs best. My brothers and sisters, I'm not sure if there are many feelings in the world sweeter than the feeling of being counted out, overlooked, mistreated, or declared the underdog Yet amidst all of the ridicule and the evidence that overwhelmingly supports these claims, you come out on top and stand with your hands raised in victory in the very face of your enemy. I don't know if anything feels, feels sweeter than being counted out or being looked over, but still getting the victory in the end. This is, this is why we are drawn to, to classic movies like Rocky and the series of Rocky 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 11, 12 Rockies. But, but, but the reason we were so drawn to that series and America recognizes it as a classic is because we love the story of the underdog, the component that, that, that allows us to see Rocky struggle, takes the worst of the beating in the beginnings of every fight. We are all witnesses and drawn to the narrative of his resilience to still come out on top, raise his hands in victory, bloody, bruised and knotted up, but still victorious. In the end, Rocky Balboa always seems to get the last laugh. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe this is why we're drawn to the spectacle of athletes like Michael Jordan, who, who in, in his high school days was cut from his basketball right. team, even though presently he's universally recognized as the greatest basketball player to ever play the game of basketball. And now, uh, two billion dollars later and six championships later, he can look back on his adversities in high school and he can get the the last laugh. laugh. I, I'm also reminded, I'm reminded of a meeting that took place at the fields in the year 2000 when the CEO of a, of a small company called Netflix, he, he had a meeting with the CEO of a big company called Blockbuster and he sits down with the CEO of Blockbuster and he tries to forewarn him of the future of video and how we watch it. He says, oh, these videotapes, these VHSs, and even the DVDs, the people are not going to be watching those as often in the future. I want to offer you an idea where people don't have to come get their videos, but you can bring their videos to their home. It's, it's this thing called, called Netflix, and I want you to buy it uh, for, the, for the small price cloud of, of $50 million, and, and he got laughed at in the meeting. He says when he recalls the story, he remembers being mocked by the CEOs and the, by the CEO and the execs of Blockbuster. And at the end of the meeting, he was laughed out of the office. But uh, some 17 years later, he looks at his accountant, yeah. looks at the work. 
part of Netflix and sees that it's worth $70 billion, wow. Chris, compared to the $50 million he tried to sell it for. And when he looks at his account, I'll say, Rita, he, he now can have his trouble. He now can have his laugh and say, you might have laughed at me then. Right. Bro. But, but, but now I can see the work of what I brought to the table. And even though you didn't see the work of what I brought to the table, even though you mocked it and overlooked it, I now, I now can have the last laugh. Maybe, maybe some of y'all don't like the practical stories. You need something a little more biblical. I remember a young man reading about a young man named David who, who was overlooked and he stood before. He wasn't equipped. He didn't have the proper way. But he stood before a nine and a half foot giant, the champion of the Philistines, and with a measly pebble and a slingshot, he said, where is the adversary so that I can handle my business? He was laughed and mocked by Goliath, but, but when he took that sword to cut his head off, he looked down at his adversary and he could get the last laugh. There was a, a young man named Joseph who at the age tender of 17, he brought a dream to his brothers and told them there would be a day when they would bow down to him and Camel. They laughed him to scorn and mocked him. And yet even though they mocked him and sold him off to slavery some 16 to 17 years later, he's now governor of the very land he was enslaved to and they had to come and bow down to him and Joseph has the opportunity even though he cried in that moment he had the opportunity to get the, the last laugh it's a, it's a sweet feeling when you know that in spite of how things are looking now there is still a God who's in charge of Thank you, Jesus. Uh, we know that we're in a process, uh, but we serve a God who's not just uh, over the process, he's in fact over the outcome. And the difference between uh, the enemy troubling you and God allowing something to come is that the enemy uh, may get permission uh, to trouble you, but he will not have permission uh, to determine uh, the outcome. Wow. But God uh, will yeah. give permission mission to trouble you, but he also has authority over, over the outcome. Here it is in this text, Psalm 126, we have a, a psalm of restoration, so to speak. Uh, the chosen people of God have been held in captivity by the Babylonian rule and Babylonian system for over 70 years, and the Bible lets us know in Jeremiah that they thought that this captivity would last long, but in fact Jeremiah prophesied that actually I'm not here to tell you that the captivity is over, I'm actually here to tell you that you're going to be in it for another 70 years or so, so you might as well prepare yourself to endure this trial and here they get to the day where God set some of them free from their exile now here's the thing that's important about this these are God's chosen people. These are God's ordained people. And even though they have been pre-selected and ordained by God to be his chosen, it does not make them exempt from captivity. Uh, let me help wow. you again. Even though they've been pre-selected by God to be his chosen, it does not make them exempt from captivity. Let me, let me help somebody in here. We thought when we prayed to God that everything just gets better right away. Thinking that because we serve God, our life is supposed to be perfect. And therefore we treat God as if he's some genie or something and everything is just supposed to snap up and be alright. God said, no, some things I have to let you go through because if we understood the captivity of the Israelites, of the children who live in Judah mainly and in Jerusalem who were captive, uh, held captive by the Babylonians, if we understood their captivity, we would know that they actually were not held captive by 
the fault of their enemy, but God allowed their enemy to take them captive because they lost sight of God. Wow. See, there's some wow. things God will allow to set you straight and put you back in your place. God said every storm that comes is not because the devil just wants to stop and block your blessing. Some storms come because we got ourselves into a mess. And God said, if you turn away from me, you're going to meet some very, very troubling, some troubling times. But in spite of them tripping themselves into this captivity, the Bible lets us know that God still sets them free. Now, here's the beauty. Even though they're pre-selected by God, they also have to deal with some stuff. Is there anybody that knows you've been chosen by God, but it does not make you exempt from attacks? In fact, when you're chosen by God, the attacks double. When you're, when you're chosen by God, the attacks are more frequent, Chris, yeah. because the enemy does not want your faith to remain strong in God. And it says that when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, or when he brought back the captives of Zion we were like those who dream here's where it gets good for a few of you the Bible says that we were like those who dream in other words the freedom and liberation from that captivity was so good and refreshing that it was almost like they were living a dream it seemed like they were living something that was surreal or it was something that was not actually happening see when you're in the captivity or in a circumstance for so long, you start to doubt that you could ever come out of it. Right. Therefore, if God ever sets you free, you almost don't believe it because you've been in it for so long. And as a man of God, God sent me on assignment today to encourage a few of you that he is about to put you in a season on, that's so on. good it's going to feel like Hallelujah. you're dreaming. I wish three people would catch that. He said he's about to put you in a season that's so good. You're going to have to pinch yourself a couple times. Because you're not going to be sure when you look at the statements on your account if it's real. He said you're not going to be sure if you see how many souls are getting saved. If this is really happening. You're not going to be sure when you see the peace of mind and healing that hits your body if this is really happening. God said he's about to put you in a season where you're going to be like you're living a dream. Good God Almighty, I wish four people would catch that and give God praise. Look at somebody and say, I'm about to be living a dream. Uh, this is not lofty speech. This is not to get you happy. This is to tell you the word of the Lord. I didn't make this up. He said when they restored, when he restored the fortunes back unto Zion, it was like we were living a dream. I need to encourage somebody that God had to use your storms to wake you up. And when the storm shook you out of your dormant stage, he said, I now want to make what you dreamed about real. Good God Almighty. But what you dream about doesn't become real until you wake up. Look at a name and say, it's time to get up. It's time to wake up. It's time to shake up this city. It's time to shake up our church. It's time to shake up our community. And God said, when you do my work, I'm going to do something so big in you. You don't think you dream it. When you look at the school you get into, you don't think you dream it. When you look at what he blesses your family and lineage with, you don't think you dream it. When he gives you the enlargement of territory, you don't think you dream it. Because he's about to restore what was held captive from you. Somebody got to be living a dream in here. Is there anybody living a dream in this place? I'm going to be living a dream. I'm going to be walking into what God said can be a reality. The enemy wants you to think it's just a dream. The enemy wants you to think it's just something in your mind. But the devil is a liar. Whatever has been plaguing you and making you think it's too hard 
about to accomplish. God said that it's not just a dream, but it's a vision and it's a goal and it's something that I have put in you. I did find dreamers to give God a shot. Say I'm about to be living what I dreamed about. Tell Thank somebody I'm about to be living about. what I dreamed about. Hallelujah. I'm about to be walking in what I dreamed about. The enemy wanted me to think that it was just a dream and I'd be held captive all my life. But I'm about to live what was dreamed. I'm about to live what was dreamed. I'm about to sow. What was dreamed? I'm about to write. What was dreamed? I'm about to record. What was dreamed? I'm about to step into. Come on and say, Lord, we were like those who dreamed. It was almost, actually, it was almost too good to be true. Uh, too good to be true. It was almost too good to be true. But God is so big that he can make what seems too good to be true actually real. And here he does that for the captives of Judah and the captives of, of Jerusalem. And here it says that our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. And we said among the nations, I think the King James Version says, we said to the heathens or to the ones that actually held us captive. With to, uh, the, uh, to the heathens, uh, the ones that held us captive, that the Lord has done uh, great things for them. Uh, and the Lord has done uh, great things for us. Uh, in other words, God delivers them uh, and sets them free uh, in the presence uh, of uh, their very adversary uh, so that they can be a testament uh, to the non-believer uh, that God can do things uh, that you can't do. <laughs> Good God Almighty. Uh, y'all remember, y'all remember uh, when Peter was in the jail, uh, God had an angel come uh, and he even shook up the unbelief of the prison guard uh, who had to see God set them free uh, in the presence of the one trying to keep them there. Uh, God said, I'm about to bless you uh, in the presence of those who've been trying to keep you from being blessed. Wow. Uh, Lord have Thank mercy. You, Jesus. Uh, he said, I'm about to give you something uh, in the presence of those who've been trying to keep you from getting. Uh, he said that they had to shout uh, with joy uh, in the, the face or so in the presence uh, of the heathen uh, or the ones that were keeping uh, them captive. Now here, here's what I need you to understand. If we go deeper into this chapter, it says that the Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. But verse 4, it, it, it intrigued me. It intrigued me with the judge because they did make a request uh, to restore our fortunes. <laughs> okay. They, they, they make a request for God to do what verse 1 just said he did. Verse 4, they say, bring back our captives or restore our fortunes. And I was confused. I said, well, verse 1, it just said that he restored or brought back the captives. Then I had to look a little deeper. And what I found was that... I want to see where the heart of the people is. And if I do it for a small group, will they continue to praise or pray to me for the ones that are still captive? Wow. Oh, God, help me in this place. It says, Lord, restore our fortunes, even though these are the ones that just got restored. Wow. Meaning, while there are still people who are held captive, it's still our fortunes. It's not going to be a full blessing no, until everybody is set free. God said, what well, I'm about to give you, I'm just testing you to see. Will you still seek me for those that didn't get blessed like you? Will you still praise me like you did for yourself when there are those who will not be set free? There was one writer who said, even when we are most furnished by matters of praise, we still have matters of prayer. In other words, when we get something that causes us to give God glory because it's good for us, we still have other folk that may not have been blessed like we were blessed. And God says, will you praise me for the captives? I don't know a 
about you, but I don't just come to church for my chains to be set free, but I'm not satisfied till we all set free, good God Almighty, I wish I had five unselfish people that said I might be in good health, but if you sit, I'm going to praise God, I'm going to pray till we all set free, I might be blessed, but I'm going to still shout, like I need a blessing for myself, Until you get free too. Lord have mercy. I'm not going to stop shouting. Until you get free too. I'm not going to stop glorifying. Until you get healed too. I'm not going to stop seeking him. Until all the captives are free. I dare somebody to give God praise. Not for yourself this time. This one is for the dope addicts that's going to need your testimony. This one is for the prostitute that's going to need your testimony. This one is for the ones that are held captive. That's going to need our shout. Need our encouragement. Need our prophetic word. Need our dance. Need our worship. Need our prayers. Is there anybody that says, I'm not just in this for me. But if Sister Debbie going through, I'm going through. If Fields is going through, I'm going through. If Ashley's going through, I'm going through. And I'm not going to stop giving God glory and praising Him until we're all set free. Mother, preach, preach, preach. Uh, it sounds like we got some folk that don't mind glorifying Him for somebody else. We got some unselfish saints in the building. Huh? Are there about five unselfish people that say, I don't want to be set free? Huh? If my brothers and sisters huh? can't go with God, huh? bring us all. Bring us all out, bring us all out. Bring us all out, bring us all out. Huh? And bring us part and I'm crying. Huh? She's crying, I'm crying. Huh? Paul told the Roman church, rejoice with them that rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Y'all ain't talking back to me, that's scripture. I'm gonna rejoice when you get blessed. I'm gonna weep when you're going through. When you're mourning and still dealing with trials, I'm gonna lift up my head in prayer and say, Lord, bless. My brother, bless you. Bless my sister. Uh, they, they get their fortunes restored, and even though they were like those who dream, they still got to pray because there was only a few of the remnant that got set free. Lord have mercy. And here's what it says. The Bible says in the English Standard Version that it restored the fortune. And I was I was intrigued by how they worded that restored the fortune because when I looked at different versions, it just says that different versions just say that the captives were brought back. And what that showed me was their fortune was not in their possessions being restored. Okay. Oh God. Their fortunes were not in their things being restored. Their, their fortune was not in their stuff being restored, but their fortune were, was in the captives being set free. And some of us get more excited about a new house and a new car than we do about somebody that was in bondage being set free. Lord have mercy. Some of us get more excited about an unexpected trip in the mail huh? than we do about somebody getting delivered of addiction huh? or somebody being set free. I came to tell you that God huh, is about to shake up some stuff huh? and we gonna rejoice huh? just as much huh? when somebody gets set free huh? as we would if it was our stuff huh? getting blessed. Huh? Our fortune is in one another. Hallelujah! of the body of Christ is the connectivity of the body. Bro. Oh my, oh my goodness. God. Oh my. They are not rejoicing because they got stuff back. They rejoice because captives are set free. Wow. Wow. I want to get to a day where captives are coming in here and we dance and shout like a million dollar check just got put in our hands. I want to get to the day where deliverance takes place and we 
we dance and shout because we care about one another. Wow, wow, wow. This is so good. The fortune is in each other. The body is not effective if it's broken. Mm. Ah, thank you, Jesus. Therefore, they felt good that they were being reconnected with other members of the body. Woo, Jesus. Therefore, we've got to know that we cannot be fortunate until we know where our fortune lies. Wow, wow, Our fortune wow. does not lie in our personal ability. Our fortune lies in our ability to connect with someone else's ability, to connect with someone else's ability, to connect with someone else's ability, until we are connected and setting folks free. Yes, oh, yes. Oh. they just got their fortune restored. It's about three of you in here that's going to be the remnant for this body. Lord, have mercy. Oh, come on, bro. about three of you that's going to be the remnant for this body. He want to see what you do when you get blessed. Wow, wow, uh, wow. He said the body's depending on you. I don't know who I'm talking to, but he said he's about to give you something big, and the body's depending on you to see will you still pray for everyone else, or will you stop coming to church? Will you still look out for other people, or will you stop paying your tithes? Will you still love on your brothers and sisters, or will you say, I'm not going to do it no more. I'm not going to stay faithful no more because I got what I want. Wow, 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 wow. Uh, it says, uh, restore our fortunes, O oh Lord, uh, like streams in the Najib. And we're almost done. Uh, those who sow in tears shall reap uh, with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. In other words, your tears in the sight of God is literally a seed. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing. What that means is if you had tears in your eyes during this captivity, you bore the seed for sowing. During this rough season of ministry, during this rough season of church going, during this rough season of staying faithful to God and his word and his works during the frustration of trying to remain faithful to ministry God said to encourage you every tear you've cried is a seed and get ready because your harvest of laughter is coming hallelujah Jesus he said your harvest of laughter is coming your harvest of joy is coming and God said you're going to be able to look back and say oh devil oh devil you tried you tried to get our building taken away you tried to take some of our faithful members away you tried to sway the hearts of our loved ones you tried to break us apart but the saints of God we we hope the last laugh I'm a 
gave him the word that he wants me to share with you as well. He said, no matter what earthly support you don't have, he said to remind you that heaven is back here. Thing that's been seen in my spirit since Thursday. God said, I'm about to restore your fortunes. Bring back the captives. Those who were lost, those who were astray. I'm bringing them back, and I'm bringing them back more faithful than ever. But he said, here's the thing. captive is going to look like I am fully restored. So he said to forewarn you that heaven is backing you even when the earth doesn't look like it's supporting what I told you would happen. God said, I'm about to shift some of your lives into places where it's not going to look like earth is backing you. They may not buy the product initially. They may not support the business. They may not support the work. It may look like not enough souls are getting saved in your witnesses. It may look like there's not enough converts. It may look like that first conference you do may not have the support you want. It may look like that first trip you throw, you don't get enough people to come and support. He said it doesn't matter. He said heaven has already ordained it. Somebody just say heaven is backing me. Because now heaven is backing the ministry. Heaven is already on me. And the reason we get the last letter is because God has the last say. If he's not obeyed us, we can't have the last laugh because there's something to go after. But he said, I am the first and the last. The beginning and the end. The alpha and the omega. The author and the finish. Okay, y'all. Take your mind for the next place in the world. Thank you for reminding us that our pain 